Yeah. So if you look at John chapter 18 and verse number 37, of course, this is a very, very famous passage of uh, the interaction between Pilate and Jesus Christ. And verse number 37 says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault at all. And so Pilate says these very famous words, What is truth? You know, kind of mocking the fact that Christ has come to bear witness of the truth, the fact that if you are of Christ, you will hear, if you are of the truth, you will hear the voice of Christ. And Pilate, who has the very truth before him, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, you know, truth embodied in a human being, Pilate says, what is truth? What is truth? And so we're continuing our series, or we're really starting the series on the armor of God. The first sermon that I preached on Wednesday was more of an introduction. But the, you know, the, the next item that, that is mentioned in that chapter, I'll just read it to you, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. The title for the sermon this afternoon is Girt About With Truth. So once again, we're talking about the armor of God, the whole armor of God. We want to have, make sure that we put all of it on and we need to be people of the truth. We need to be people that love the truth. We need to be people that are seeking the truth. And of course, this is why you're saved, because you found the truth. You found the truth in the gospel. You found the truth in Jesus Christ. And praise God for the truth that we do have. You know, we're not like Pilate, which is saying, well, what is truth? Hey, what is the way to salvation? How can we know what is true and what is not? And you know what? Pilate of this day, what is truth, is no different to many politicians today. All right? You know, for, for Pilate, this was more, you know, truth could never be something that's absolute. What is it? Something that is true today may not necessarily be true tomorrow. And we see this when our politicians campaign and they give their promises and they stand for certain things during their campaign, but when they get elected, they don't do what they say they'll do. Right? The truth has changed for them. Okay? Because it's all just what do the people want? It's not about having, finding the absolute truth. You know, for politicians, it's, well, what is true today? You know, there was a time when Australians had law against sodomy, against homosexuality. Yep. That was the truth. Amen. And now they found a new truth, right? The new truth now is to celebrate it, to enjoy it, you know, to, to praise uh, sodomy. You know, our laws keep changing because our politicians keep changing. They do not have absolute truth. And, you know, that's a terrible place to be in life, right? Thank God we know what is true. Thank God we have the gospel. We know Christ is true. We know His book is true. We know the Holy Spirit that we have in us is true. But you know, Christ rejectors, they don't have the truth. Pilate did not have the truth. Unbelievers don't have the truth. And uh, it's, it's a sad thing for them. You know, and we should think about how blessed we are that we have the truth. There are so many lies in this world. You know, there's only one truth and many lies. You know, we can say one plus one. There's only one truth to that. It's two, but then how many lies could there be to that answer? You know, three would not be true. Ten would not be true. A million would not be true. You know, there are more, true, uh, more lies than there is truth. There's one truth and many, many lies. You know, there is one true gospel and many, many false gospels. There is one Messiah, one way to heaven, and many, many other, you know, uh, so-called false gospels out there. And so we, we thank God that we have the truth and not only are we people of the truth that hear the voice of Jesus Christ, but we ought to be girt about with truth. You know? So the picture here is that when you put on your armor, you put on the belt. Okay? So let me just go through the advantages of being saved, the advantages that we have. And I already kind of covered it. We have Christ, okay? the way, the truth, and the life. That's number one. But you're in the book of John, so please go to John chapter 17 now. John chapter 17. And when it comes to this topic of truth, the book of John just keeps hammering this, like chapter after chapter, you know, as to what the truth is. And I look at John chapter 17 and verse number 16. John chapter 17, verse number 16, Jesus Christ says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify them. Sorry, I, I sanctify myself 
that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So now that we are of the truth, we, are, we do have Christ, what, is our, what, do we, what do we need to do as Christians? We need to be sanctified. We need to be cleansed. And how are we sanctified? How are we cleansed? Through the truth. And what is the truth here? Thy word is truth. And, you know, I say this, and I, I don't know, it might sound like a broken record sometimes, but the great thing about the Bible is we know it's 100% true. Everything we read here is true. Even the lies are truly recorded for us. Okay? Everything we know here is true. What I mean by the lies is obviously things that other people say, things that are recorded by the Pharisees and false teachers. You know, even that is co correctly uh, captured for us so we can know the truth of what these other people were teaching. We have complete truth here. This is the only object that we have in life that we can be on, like, you know, um, sure about that we have the truth of, right? I'm sure a lot of us have turned off the TVs, right? A lot of us have turned off watching mainstream media and all the news, but I don't know about you, I found myself getting drawn back into watching the media over these months because of the pandemic. Primarily not because of the virus so much, but primarily just so I knew what was going on, what kind of restrictions were happening, what can we do about church, what's the effect, what are the risks, what are the consequences. But a lot of people think the news is true. Now, does it have truth? I'm sure it definitely has truth. But does it have lies? It always has lies. What about YouTube? What about BitChute? What about Facebook? What about all the articles that you can find in, online? or your newspapers, or your magazines, does it contain truth? Many times there's a lot of great truths. Many great things you can learn from those things, but are there lies? And are there more lies than truths in the world? There's so many more lies. And so that's the thing about all these other forms of media and information, is that you know, you're trying to learn certain things, but you also have to be aware that what I'm learning, what I'm hearing, could very well contain lies. Okay? But I don't have that concern when I read this book. I never have that concern. I know I can read this. I know it's true. And I know I have the Holy Spirit. That's the next point. Go to John chapter 14. Go to John chapter 14 and verse number 16. We want to be girt about with truth, right? You go out, you put your belt on. Hey, you know what? This book, the truth that you've got here should be like that belt. It should always be available to you. All right, and if you don't walk around with your Bible, get the app on your phone or something, right? Just be ready to have the Word of God available to you, just like when you put your belt on, you get out, you've got it on all day. Hey, we should always have access to the Word of God. But in John chapter 14, verse number 16, these are words of Christ. It says, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Wow, praise God. Another comforter. Well, that, what does that mean? That means Jesus was a comforter. To the disciples in his day but he's going to send another comforter which we have hey the holy spirit is our comforter and he's going to abide with us forever verse number 17 even the spirit of truth hey praise god the one that abides with us forever spiritually speaking is the spirit of truth not the spirit of lies but the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive whom the world cannot receive how blessed are you brethren that you have the holy spirit in you you have God residing in you, the spirit of truth. The world doesn't have that. What amazing power, what amazing privilege we've been given by God to have the Holy Spirit because it seeth him not, the world doesn't receive him, see him, neither knoweth him, but you know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The spirit of truth. So we have so many advantages, brethren. We have the truth. Jesus Christ is our Savior. We have the Holy Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of truth. It's going to help us to understand the difference between what is true and what are lies. And we have the Word of God, which we never have to doubt. We just can read it. We know this is a true account of what is being uh, taught to us. We, ha we have truth all over. You know, we, we have, we're surrounded by truth. We're, we're so blessed to have the truth when the world does not have it. When the world does not have the truth. Okay? Please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy, and so we're going to look at a few passages in Timothy. So, you know, obviously Timothy was a pastor. Paul had set him there to do some ordinations, to serve faithfully in his church. And so 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are epistles primarily written to pastors. But just because it's primarily written to pastors doesn't mean it's just 
to be read by pastors or followed by pastors. It's for the entire church. And so we get a lot of great doctrines about church as well when it comes to the book of Timothy, First and Second Timothy. But look at verse number 15, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. Because the next point that I have here, brethren, is that your choice of church is important. The church that you choose to visit and attend week after week is so important for you to be able to be girt about with truth, to have the armor of God on. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 reads, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, are there churches that are not the pillar and ground of the truth? So many! How many truths? How many lies? Very few truths. Many, many lies. And when it comes to churches, very few are true. And many of them are lies. Many of them are teaching false things. But a church ought to be a place where it is the pillar and ground of the truth. So whatever church you select, whether it's this church, or one day you don't find yourself at New Life Baptist Church, you find yourself in another place with some other church, you better make sure that church is a pillar and ground of truth. It's the church of the living God. And of course, we have the Lord God living in us. And so the choice of our church is so important because this is another method that God has given us in order to receive truth. Okay? To receive truth. It's from the preaching of God's Word. Please go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 for me. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 12. And a lot of your decision of what church you're going to be part of is the pastor. It is the leader you know, that's in that church and what they're teaching. Are they teaching what is true? Because when we looked at the book of Revelations and we saw the seven churches, we saw many good churches or churches that belong to Jesus Christ, right? But then they had really bad leaders. One church had Jezebel preaching at it, okay? And so these are two things, you know. Uh, yes, finding a, a, a church that teaches the truth, teaches the right gospel, but having a bad preacher, having a bad pastor can really mess you up. And in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, this is an instruction that's given to pastors. And listen, and I, I know that some of this overlaps with what I covered this morning, but understand that the reason I try to preach hard, the reason I, I try to preach things that might be controversial, that you may not necessarily like all the time, is because we're commanded by God to do that. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2 says, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. What that means is if something is out of season, just preach it, you know, sorry, in season, just preach against it. If it's some type of sin that everyone enjoys doing and people are loving, just preach against it. It doesn't matter what season you're in. Just preach the truth. Preach the word. Look at this. Reprove. Okay, that's correct. Rebuke. Sometimes you've got to be called out. Exhort, built up with all long suffering and doctrine. Why is this so important? Why is it important to have a, a good preacher who's doing their best to preach the word of God? Because it says in verse number three, for the time will come when they, that's talking about the church here, okay? When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Why is it important that you have a spirit-filled preacher who's preaching the truth of the God's word? You know, not, not concerned if he may offend you. Why is that important? Because it, it starts to corrupt the church. The people in the church will suffer from bad preaching. Eventually, you're not going to be able to endure sound doctrine. Okay, eventually you're going to uh, look for teachers that are going to be there to scratch your ears. You have those itching ears. You just want to hear things that you love. And eventually your ears will turn away from the truth and turn onto fables. You start to believe stupid things. You start to accept stupid doctrines. And you know, one stupid doctrine, Genesis chapter 6, fallen angels, marrying women, spiritual beings, marrying women and having giants as offspring that's a fable that's stupidity you know it doesn't jive with the bible at all it doesn't jive with our understanding of science you know that everything brings forth after its own kind genesis 1 god makes it clear that everything brings forth after its own kind 
Anybody that starts to pick up the Bible and reads the first chapter knows that very fundamental truth of genetics. And yet a fallen angel who's not a physical being marries some woman and creates some giants? Hey, that's a fable. Now look, I know good people that believe that. Friends that believe that. Okay? So look, why? You say, why do they believe that? Well, they sought after doctrines that scratched the ears. They, they, they moved away from looking for the sound truth and they went after the fables, the fancy stories. You know? That's a stupid... I mean, I don't, that is a stupid doctrine. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is fables. But this is what happens. If you don't have a good preacher, you're going to start exploring in these other areas. You know, these sci-fi things. And uh, it, it's, it can be very, very dangerous. And so what I want to draw your attention, though, you know, there is, is that the preacher needs to, obviously, like I said, preach things doesn't matter what season it's in. Preach it if it's in the Word of God. Rebuke. What else was there? It said reprove. And so sometimes it's things that may uh, get to you deeply. You may feel offended. You may, I don't know, you may feel like the pastor's attacking you. Maybe sometimes the preacher's attacking you. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing to set you straight, to keep you in the truth. But I want you to understand another part of this. And, and if you can please go to, uh, you're in 2 Timothy, please go to chapter 2 and verse number 24. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. Because this is why church is so important. And, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not against you going and listening to online preaching. Great preachers out there. Praise God for them, okay? But if you become just a Christian that just listens online, you're just listening to preaching, you're hearing great preaching, powerful preaching, you know, the preacher's ripping face, but you don't go to church. You know what you're going to get used to? You're going to be watching that. You're going, man, I love that preaching. I, I love that attitude. I love how he rips face. I love how he rebukes. And you don't go to church. And you just keep listening to that week after week after week. Guess how you're going to treat people? The same way. You're going to think that's how we behave. That's how we talk to people. That's how I treat people that are different to me. That's how I talk to people that have different doctrines. But no, that's not. See, that's part of it. That's preaching behind the pulpit. It ought to be hard. It ought to be direct, right? But look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. And this is how you know if you've got a good preacher, okay? Because he's able to preach hard. But then, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Gentle unto all men. Is that the impression you get? If you just listen to online preaching, some guy's ripping face, and that's all. You never go to that person's church. You don't go to church, so you don't know how that person interacts with, their, with the congregation. You don't know how that person react, uh, acts with his family. You don't know how that person acts with the community. Because you're left with this idea, that's how we ought to act. Just rip people up. Just tear people down. No, because the good preacher that does preachers like that, when he deals with people one-on-one, -on -one, with his congregation, he's gentle unto all men. Okay, so you've got to have the balance. Preach hard to the church, but one-on-one -on -one with people, you be nice to them. You be gentle with people, right? Not striving with people. Look at this, apt to teach, patient. Okay, patient, in meekness. Meek, patient, right? All this stuff, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And so one way to get rid of uh, false doctrine. One way to help someone get into the truth, yes, is to preach hard behind the pool, but that's important. But another aspect is just to be one-on-one -on -one gentle with somebody and help that person understand why they're wrong on something rather than just tearing them apart because you're not just like us or you don't believe just like us. Be gentle, right? People, look, it says there verse 20, uh, instructing those that oppose themselves. People that believe false doctrine are just opposing themselves. They're hurting themselves, right? But we're called to, uh, like, uh, if God prevention, give them repentance to the acknowledge on the truth. We, we're trying to help that person go from the false doctrines that they have to acknowledge and receive the truth. Look at verse number 26. Why is this so important? That they may, sorry, that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So why are there so many false doctrines out there? Because the devil's putting them in there. The devil's thrown out all this false stuff out there, trying to get it to stick on to someone, 
so it can prevent them from being someone that is serving the Lord, prevent them from doing the works of God, prevent them from having a greater knowledge of the Word of God. But the servant, the preacher, is gentle with those people on a one-on-one level. Okay, So that's how you know if you're in a good church that cares for the truth. We want them to acknowledge the truth. We preach it hard, that's one way, but one-on-one, gentle. Okay, It's not about ripping someone's face uh, on a personal level. All right, so that's the, that's the problem with you know not going to church, just listening to online preaching, because you don't see the other side of the pastor. You don't see the fellowship and the gentleness that brothers and sisters ought to have with one another. Now, please go to John chapter eight. Go to John chapter eight and verse thirty-one. John chapter eight and verse number thirty-one. And this is a topic that I really love. All right, if if there's one thing. If you, you know, that you just remember about Pastor Kevin, that you remember about New Life Baptist Church, it's this one. John chapter 8, verse 31. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Now look, when it comes to salvation, the truth does make us free. All right? We're no longer under the bondage of sin, under the bondage of trying to get our work our way to heaven, we have, made, we have uh, made, been made free. But this is not, you know, the first application of this teaching is not about salvation. Because what did Jesus say? He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. This is about discipleship. This is about living for Christ, all right? So when it says the truth shall make you free, Jesus is saying he wants to give us freedom. He wants to give us liberty in the Christian life. Okay, look at verse number 33. They answered him, We be, uh, yeah, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whoso committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Look, has the son of God made you free? saved yeah you shall be free indeed there is liberty in the christian life and this is so important i really want you to get this i really want you to get this we're and we're an independent fundamental baptist church i love the word fundamental i'm a fundamentalist i love it i don't care how people try to portray that i love that name i love that term but there are certain parts of fundamentalism that i don't like okay uh, and, and what that is, brethren, is this restrictive, you know, lifestyle that some pastors, some churches try to force upon their congregation or people within the congregation forcing that on others in the congregation. Now, brethren, look, I have a fear of God. I want to do what's right. I love my children. I want to bring them up godly. I want them to love the Lord, Okay you know what? I don't need some book at Kurong to tell me how to do that. I don't need that level of instruction. I have God's word. He tells me how to do it. And I'm going to go to Christina, my wife, and say, how are we going to apply this? How are we going to raise our family? How are we going to live our lives? And I'm not going to expect that from you. What I want from you is for you to go to the word of God, find out what God, how God wants you to do things, and you do things in the, within the boundaries that God allows. God gives us liberty. Think of Adam in the Garden of Eden. God said, not this tree, but all the other trees go ahead and eat it. You know what a lot of fundamentals, fundamentalists are like? If they were God putting Adam in the Garden of Eden, they'd be like, you can only eat of this tree. All right. And all the other trees don't even touch him. That is the best tree. That is the right tree. If you want to be like one of us, you better eat of that tree. You eat of that second tree over there, you know, you're not like us. No, you know, Christ has given us liberty. And don't confuse this. I'm not talking about liberty to sin, though you do have the liberty of sin, okay? But there are consequences for that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how we live our lives in accordance to God's word. God has given us so much freedom. You know, if God just told us everything to do, how to brush our teeth, what to eat for breakfast, what time to eat, what time to read your Bible, gave us every little detail, you know what it'd be? It'd be bondage. Because we'd be every moment thinking, you know, when's the time? Think of the, the Muslims. Don't they have to pray, like, is it three times a day or something? I don't know. Five times a day. That's bondage. So they're always, all oh, the time, oh, oh, quickly, quickly, go and pray. Is that how God wants us to be? In bondage? No. 
And so what, what we get out of this, brethren, is that, and I, I, because, I'm telling you this because I hate this. I hate this behavior where people think you have to live a certain way, right? You have to raise your children a certain way. You have to do it this way or that way because pastor so-and-so said so. No, that's stupidity. That's not the liberty. That's not the freedom that God has given us. And listen, I'm all in favor of liberty, okay? And I, I want to give you guys all the liberty. Sometimes I have people, you know, apologize to me. And I'm like, why? <laughs> don't apologize to me. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> you, know? you don't have to do it the way, if you come and ask me for advice and I give you advice, but you don't take that advice, you do it differently. It's your life. You have liberty. You can choose as long as it's not sin. I'm not, I'm not condoning sin. I'm just saying within your life, just do what is right. Do what God tells you. Okay? You don't have to ag agonize and say, God, is this the job you want to give me? Listen, there's like thousands of professions. Thousands of professions. And you say, well, I want God's will. Which job do I do? Do I become an electrician? Do I become a farmer? God, oh. you know what God wants for you? Just work a job. Just choose. God says, look, there's a thousand. Just do it. Just get a job. That's God's will for you. <laughs> Go get a job, man. Provide. You know, there's liberty. That's, you know, there's, there's liberty. Now, look, I'm, I'm not saying there's never a time to ask God to open doors and close certain doors and make it clear which way to go. But, you know, if God's not giving you that one answer, it's probably because there's a thousand right answers. Just take one. Instead of, look, it's better you take one than not take any and just agonize, what is, my, what is God's will for my life? There's liberty, okay? There's liberty. We don't have to be exactly the same. And I'm not going to get offended if you don't do things exactly like me. And you shouldn't get offended if I don't do things exactly like you. Don't get offended if I don't take your advice. I'm not going to get offended if you don't take my advice. Okay? And, and you know what? I don't like giving advice. I don't because I'd rather... Say, you got liberty, you got the Holy Ghost, you got the Bible, you know what God wants, you know what God expects, work it out. You know, we're not, I'm not raising, I'm not trying to have a church of sucklings that just come to the pastor for everything. And there are churches like this. There are independent Baptist churches like this in places across this world. Pastor, what do I do? Pastor, what do I do? Can I go on holidays? Who do I marry, pastor? It's like, hey, is she saved? Marry her. <laughs> Do you like her? Just marry her. I, I'm not going to tell you who. Like, you know, liberty. All right? You know, when it comes to the topic of vaccinations, hey, I'm anti-vax. I don't vaccinate my kids. But you know what? If a parent comes up to me and says, you know what? I feel this is the best thing for my family, my kids. I'm going to vaccinate them. I'm not going to get offended. I'll be like, you know what? There's liberty. They're your children. You do what you want. I'm not your parent. I'm not going to get offended by you by doing that, okay? And I, I'm always affording people liberties, but then when they find out I don't vaccinate my kids, they don't want to give me liberty for that, right? They'll be like, how dare you be, you know, allow your children to, to whatever, whatever arguments they make, right? Don't you love your children? Why don't you vaccinate? Hey, that's not liberty. There is liberty in God. There is freedom in God, you know? S you know, homeschooling. The schools, someone says, I'm going to put my kids in school. I'm against schools. I've preached for homeschooling. Hey, but uh, it's not, it doesn't happen here, but if someone said to me, you know what, I heard you're preaching at homeschooling, I think it's cool, but I'm going to put my kids in the school system, sorry. It's like, why are you saying sorry? Uh, don't worry, you do what you want. They're your children, okay? You do, you go ahead and do whatever you want. Hey, there are consequences to our actions, and you may very well have to face certain consequences, but it's your kids, I'm not offended, you do whatever you like, brother. You know, and I have the freedom to do what I want with my children, which is to homeschool my children. Okay, I have the, you know, we have liberty. You know, when it comes to doctrines, right? Someone says, well, I believe the pre-trib rapture. Well, I'm going to, well, believe it. Believe the pre-trib rapture if you want. But then when I say, I don't believe the pre-trib rapture, what is wrong with you? Aren't you right with God? Maybe you should have gone to Bible college. You know, the Jews... You know, you want to believe the Jews are chosen, God's chosen people? You've got the liberty of believing that. I don't, it doesn't affect me. Okay, and usually if someone says to me, oh, look, the Jews are God's chosen people, I ask them a few things. I say, first of all, if that Jew remains unsaved and does not believe in Jesus, does he go to heaven or hell? Most often than not, they'll say hell. 
All right, so if the Jew was there and he needed, he's not saved, what would you do to him? What would you, I oh, would give him the gospel, get him saved. Okay, I agree. So we're actually very alike. <laughs> we, we both believe that Jew without Christ is going to hell. And what that Jew needs is to believe the gospel to be saved. And if you want to give him the title, God's chosen people, it's just a title. That means nothing then. Because we believe the same thing. They go into hell without Jesus Christ. I don't, you can believe it if you want. But give me the liberty of believing what the Bible says, that everybody that is a believer of Jesus Christ is his chosen people. Amen. That we're a holy nation of God. And we've got clear scriptures about that. But look, if you want to go and believe something else, go and believe something else. Liberty, brethren. There's liberty when it comes to the church, when it comes to living a Christian life. This is not a cult. All right? And that's what the cults love. They love control. Right? right? You leave this church, you're not saved. Right, brother? Right? You don't live according to this life. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're wrong with God. Or, you know, this is not a cult. And I don't want to see independent fundamental Baptist churches become cults. Yeah. There are plenty of churches like that. I mean, look at the brethren. The open brethren, they're not too bad, but the closed brethren, you know, you've got to live just like them or you're out of the church. And you get out of the church, your family turns against you, everyone turns against you because you've not followed the church guidelines. There's not liberty there. Okay? And it's just, it's just what we see with the Pharisees and the scribes. They've got all these traditions of men. They're criticizing everybody around them because they're not following them. But it's not something God laid out. You know, there's something strange about men. We love to control people. We, we want people to follow lockstep. Now, one thing that I had to learn, if I'm so desperate to get someone to agree with me, if I'm that desperate, it's because I'm not even confident. And by getting that person to agree with me kind of gives me assurance, oh, maybe I'm right because now he's believed it. Listen, I do things, I live, I, I live my life, I believe certain doctrines because of my study, because of my experience, because I've seen that it works. If you don't agree with me, you don't do it that way, well, I'm confident in what I'm doing. I'm confident in, in my relationship with my wife. I'm confident with how I raise my children. Okay? And look, I, I'm not perfect. I'm not saying I'm perfect. There are always going to be consequences to maybe not doing things perfectly, right? But... There is liberty, and we need to afford people that liberty. You know, we're not trying to make this club, this boys club, and you've got to be just like us and believe just like us, and if you're not, you're on the outer. Uh, that's just stupidity. That's a cult, okay? That is a cult, all right? So, the truth shall make you free. And like I said, I want you just to remember this. You know, if this is the only thing you remember from Pastor Kevin is, no, he taught us Christ has made us free. As long as we stay within the boundaries of what God has given us, He gives us so much freedom. You know, and if we stay within those boundaries, there's peace, there's joy, there's fellowship, and there's differences, there's distinctions. That's good. I, I, I'd rather talk to someone that's different to me than, like, if I had someone that believed every doctrine just the same as I do, everything, every verse we just same, you know what? That's going to be a very boring conversation. Like, what do we have to talk about? <laughs> what do we have to discuss? I like it when we have different views. I like it when we, you know, iron sharpen a fine and we, we discuss things and we bring things to the table. But we're trying to be good about with truth, right? And the truth uh, shall make you free, the Bible tells us. Please go to, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 4 for me. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 34. Uh, sorry, 24, 24. Ephesians 4, 24. When we talk about the truth, obviously we can't avoid lies. Like, we can't avoid not talking about lying, okay? So in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 24, it says, And that ye put on the new man, after, sorry, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So what God is basically saying, very simple concept, if you tell lies, you're not telling the truth. Put away the lying. Now, it's interesting that this is actually in the book of Ephesians. Because when it comes to the Ephesian church, they were like really great. If you read the epistle of the Ephesians, Paul is hardly correcting them about anything. It's just a very deep doctrinal book. Because the church is doing well. But when you look at some of the other epistles to the other churches, like the Corinthians and sometimes the Galatians or other you know, churches, Paul is constantly trying to correct them. Constantly trying to get something right. Whereas the Ephesians, it's a very doctrinal book because there's not really any major problems. But even with this good, great church, Paul has to tell them, put away lying. So even within a good church, there were brethren that were lying toward one another. 
Okay, they weren't telling the truth. And so if we can see that in a great church like the Ephesians, then this could be a problem in our church. Okay? And if we're someone that, that we're trying to gird about ourselves with truth, we need to make sure we put away the line that we don't go and lie to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, if, where, where I want to find the most honest people is not in my workplace. It's in my church. If I'm looking for honest people, I'll, I'll say, look, there are people in my church, these people are honest. They're not going to lie. That's what I hope. Now, are we going to lie to one another? Sometimes it's going to happen. It's probably already happened, right? And this is why we need to put that away, right? Speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You know, we're, 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 one, we're, the, we're the body of Christ, the church, right? And if we're lying, we're just lying to each other. We're lying to that one body that God has set us in, the, the local church. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 22, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delights. Okay, so lies are an abomination to the Lord, but you just deal truly, you tell the truth, the Lord delights in that. You know, if you tell the truth to your hurt, the Lord delights in it. To your hurt, you may think, man, I should have just lied. I would have got, things would have been better for me. No, you know, you would have upset the Lord, you know, but by telling the truth, even at your hurt, it delights the Lord. And he's going to reward you. He's going to bless you for telling the truth, even at your own hurt. You know, which brings me to my next point, because we're trying to teach about truth here. And uh, the Australian National Anthem, let me just uh, speak about that quickly. So uh, I'll just try to sing it a little bit. If you know the words, I'll stop here and let's see if you know the words. You know, Australians, let us all rejoice for we are young and free with golden soil and well for toil. Maybe Sam, do you know this one, Sam? Our home is girt by sea. Hey, we're to be girt, right, with the truth. What does girt mean? If, if our nation is girt by sea. It's surrounded by sea, right? We're an island nation. We don't, our borders don't touch some other nation. To be girt by sea is to be surrounded by sea. And so when we're talking about being girt uh, with truth, we need to be surrounded by truth. We need to be careful about the influences, be careful about what we listen to, the books we read. Careful, you know, have a critical eye, have a critical ear to everything else besides this book. Anything else could contain errors, could contain lies. And I bring this up because, you know, as people who are of the truth, we ought to be seeking the truth, always. We should always desire, we should love the truth. And you know, there is the truth of movement. Some of you guys are aware of that, the truth of movement. Um, and, you know, usually within the truth of movement, there's a lot of conspiracy theories, right? There's lots of things out there. And I'm all for conspiracy theories, because I know there's definitely conspiracies out there. I know this world hates our Lord. I know there's evil forces at work in this world. This is why we need the whole armor of God, right? But do you think that's all true? Is it always true? I'm in favor of finding out, trying to find the truth, trying to do some research. I'm in favor of all that. But you've got to be careful because I guarantee you, if you've gone and looked into some of these conspiracy theories, you've also swallowed a lot of lies. Con Definitely. Why? Because it's not the Bible. That's why. Because many of these people aren't even saved. They don't have the Spirit of God. And you know what? I have found great YouTube channels. Right? Like, this is great information. I really enjoy this. I'm learning a lot of things. And then later on, there's a channel. Well, the fallen angels had babies with, with <laughs> Genesis 6, and they had giants. I'm like, oh, man. Now I don't know what's... <laughs> Why do they always go that way? Well, there are walking reptilian people on this earth right now that are physically being born from Satan or something, right? I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating. I don't know. But there's this kind of information out there. But you know what? These same people probably had some really great truth. But then without the Word of God, as, not, as unbelievers, as unsafe people, they captured some truth, but then they went crazy. You know, this Bible keeps us sane. It keeps us stable. And whatever we listen to, yes, there is elements of truth, but we also need to go back to the Word of God and say, God, does this line up with your Word? And if it doesn't line up with your Word, I'm just going to reject it. Be willing to reject certain things that you believe today, okay? You may have invested hours and hours of YouTube research. You may have invested hours and hours of emotional attachment to some belief, and it's a lie. It could very well be a lie. 
Does it line up with God's word? Is this something that God teaches you? Or is it not? You know, how many times do people promote the end times and this is going to happen and this guy's the, you know, President Obama was, is the, is the Antichrist and, you know, President Bush before him was the Antichrist. I'm pretty sure the president before him was the Antichrist. I'm pretty sure Hillary is the devil. <laughs> <All right. laughs> what I'm saying to you guys, brethren, now, look, can, are we going to hear lies? Yes. But you've got to be a filter. You know, you can't just accept everything and get emotionally... Remember that turning to fables? You know, that, that, well, that's not... You know, church should be a place where you don't turn to fables. You know where you would definitely turn to fables? YouTube. Bit shoot. It's, it, it's a lot of great truths. Don't get me wrong. Please, I'm not saying don't investigate, don't research, don't try to find the truth. I'm saying let's be people of the truth, but whatever we learn, we need to go back to the Word of God and confirm, can this be right? Can this be wrong? For me, personally, the way I do this... You know, when I hear something and I think, you know, there could be some truth to this, I listen, I absorb it, but I don't go and promote it. It doesn't just start flowing out of my mouth, okay? It might take several years. I don't care how long it takes, where it just sits on the back of my mind and I just process it through different, through time, process it with other information, process it with my greater understanding of the Word of God, and sometimes I'm like, yep, this is crap, see you later. That's nonsense. And like there are a lot of things in my head that I have right now that are just sitting there in the back of my mind. I'm not on this trigger to find out the truth. What is going on exactly? When it comes to this COVID-19 virus, I don't know. I've heard lots of different opinions. It's all in the back of my head, just processing there. And I'm going to be very careful about what I say about it. Because I don't know. I don't know. Okay? If we want to be surrounded by truth, we need to be careful of the lies. And listen... Who's the father of lies? Satan, right? Can you please go to John chapter 8? John chapter 8. What I'm trying to say to you, brethren, is be careful of what you promote. Okay? Because you may very well be promoting the same lies that the devil has inserted, you know, through the knowledge that you've gained. John chapter 8, verse number 38. And we know this passage. I mean, none of these passages are a surprise, right? John chapter 8, verse 38. Jesus says to the unbelieving Jews, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Who's their father? They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they, then said they to him, we be not born of fornication, we have one Father, even God. Jesus answered unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your Father, the devil, and the lust of your Father ye will do. Now let me just stop there. Let me clarify. Just... If you've been deceived and you believe the lie and now you're promoting a lie, that does not mean that you're automatically a child of the devil. If you're saved, you can never be a child of the devil, okay? Because that's a reprobate. A child of the devil is, is been, has been born of the devil, spiritually speaking. He's a, a reprobate. But, let's keep going. It says, He was a murderer from the beginning, that's the devil, and abode not in the truth. Look at this. Because there is no truth in him. There is no truth with the devil. Understand that. Look at that. When he, speaketh a, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Who's the father of lies? The devil. Can the devil ever speak truth? Never. But you say, but he's a master of mixing the truth with lies. He is. But here's the thing. As soon as you mix truth with lies, it's all a lie. None of it's true. You, it's, it's, it's partly true to deceive you. So you can receive some of it, but as you receive part of that truth, you've also received a bunch of lies as well. The devil knows how we tick. The devil knows how to lie to us and make us people that also speak out his lies. I'm very careful to give my opinion sometimes, right? Because I, I need to find something in the Word of God that confirms that. And I realize since I've become a pastor, it's kind of even more important. I was already like that before I became a pastor, but after I became a pastor, I realized, man, this is really important about what I say. I better be careful. 
you know. And I think all of us, if we're seeking the truth and we don't want to mislead our brethren, we need to make sure that we become this filter of truth. We have the Holy Spirit of God. We have the Bible. We listen, different points of view, lots of different information, and you try to filter out what is rubbish and what is true. And things that you don't know, you've also got to be satisfied sometimes you're just not going to know. You just, you, you, you're going to go to your grave not knowing. Just be satisfied. And if you can't know, and you say, look, I've tried, I've, I've looked this information in the Word of God, and I can't find a, uh, an answer, well, maybe God doesn't want you to know. Maybe that's not important. The things that are important to God are going to be black and white, clear in the Word of God. And stand on the truth that we find in the Word of God. You know, don't propagate lies. You know, if we can, uh, let's go to uh, Jeremiah. We'll end on Jeremiah. Please go to Jeremiah chapter 13. I really like this illustration here. <clears throat> and I, I might be stretching this illustration here a little bit, but I think you, you can see where I'm going here. So, we're to be girt about with truth. And of course, the girt in there re represents a belt, putting on the belt. And in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse number 1, God asks some very funny things of Jeremiah, some strange things here. In verse number 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle. That's a, like a linen belt, right? And put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. So I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord, and put it on my loins. I love Jeremiah. God says, go get a belt. He says, I'll go, I'll go get a belt. I'll put it on. <laughs> Look at verse number 3. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and, and arise, go to Euphrates, that's the Euphrates River, and hide it there in a rock, sorry, in a hole of the rock. So I went and hid it by Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Right? Say, why, God, why are you asking him to do this? You put on a belt, now take it off and go to the river, put it there in the rock. Verse number six. And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded thee to, to, <clears throat> to hide there. Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it, and behold, the girdle was marred, and it was profitable for nothing. So this belt, because it's been there by the water, it started to rot away, it's become loose, and it's, no, it's, no longer, it's not profitable for anything now. It can't be used as a girdle anymore. Verse number 8, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah, and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the, and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory but they would not hear. All right, so I want to take the principle here, right? So obviously, as Jeremiah has been asked by God to do this, that girdle represents uh, Judah, right? It represents them. And so he says, look, you know, Judah was once of great pride of Jerusalem, right? So it's something like a great belt that you can wear, but then they discard, the belt's been discarded, it's rotted away, it's been marred, and now it's good for nothing. What, what, what's that about? So the people of Judah, again, nothing new for you guys. You know this. The, they've turned away from the Lord. They've turned away from the truth. They've gone and served other gods, and they've become like this belt that can't be used. All right. So what I want to do here is basically take the principle here, right? And the principle is, is this, that if you don't wear the belt, it'll be good for nothing. If you don't wear the belt, it'll be good for nothing. All right. So Jeremiah takes it off. And during that time, it rotted away. It became good for nothing. Where to be girded with truth, okay? We should always be seeking to walk in truth. You know, you receive a lot of truth through this church. You receive a lot of truth by the online preaching that you listen to, by your own personal time in the Word of God. You receive a lot of truth, and God wants you to take that truth and wear it, right? He wants you to live out the truth that you have. You know, and, and this, is, this is the danger that we can have in our churches where we're blessed with so much truth, we hear it, but we don't live it out. We know what is true. We know what we should do, 
but we don't do it. And we become like Judah. We, we go after our own ways. We know what God wants, but I'm going to do it my own way, God. I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. And, you know, you may not go as far as worshiping other gods like they did here, but hey, you go about your own way. You know, you're, you're, you're hearing truth, but you're just not living it out. You're not wearing the belt, right? You're not wearing the belt. And listen, when you don't wear it, it's going to wear out. It'll be good for nothing. You have all this truth, but it's good for nothing because you're not living it out, right? And that's what the belt represents, the fact that you put it on, you keep it on all day long, you go to work with it, right? You, 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 before you go to church, you put on your belt, you get out there. That should be a picture of the fact that you need to be surrounded by the truth. Always have the truth with you. Live by the truth. Know the truth of God. You know, live it out in your lives because if you don't live it out, brethren, if you set it aside, you take it to the river Euphrates, it'll be marred, it'll be good for nothing. You won't be profitable for God. You won't be able to walk in the truth that God has set for you. So, brethren, that's the conclusion. As we continue through this series, please understand we're going through the whole armor of God. Truth is important, but it's not just truth. There are other elements of the armor that we need to put on in order to be effective soldiers for the Lord. All right, let's pray.